Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Lindborg, and I'm the president of the United States Institute of Peace, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you here to USIP. We are very honored uh, to have with us this afternoon President Beji Kayed Esebsi and his delegation uh, who, are, who have joined him here at U.S. Institute of Peace as part of his first official visit to the United States since being sworn in as president in December 2014. Um, I know most of us here have watched with great interest and much hope as Tunisia has forged ahead with a democratic transition ever since late 2011 when events there triggered a dramatic regional shift. Following successful parliamentary and presidential elections last year, Tunisia has solidified its commitment to the establishment of a representative government through the formation of a coalition government. And I know that we all wish Tunisia all the best and watch with great interest as it navigates the challenges ahead and remains standing as one of the only successful examples from the post-Arab Spring period. Um, I want to give a, th a few thanks. Um, we're very pleased and honored to have worked alongside so many friends and partners uh, over the last month, and we're especially grateful for the support of Ambassador Goia, who has had an amazing first week in his new post as ambassador, both presenting his credentials and welcoming his president. Um, also to the Deputy Chief of Mission, Kais uh, Daraji, Councillor Amel Ben uh, Yunus, and the entire embassy staff. We're also very appreciative of the long-standing partnership we've had with Ambassador um, Shalefa, who is with us here today, uh, and Ambassador Janawi. Also, Mr. Uh, Mohsen Marzouk, who is with the delegation. Uh, all of us have joined us, and we're thankful for the partnership. We also uh, would like to offer our gratitude to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including the Director General, Ambassador Kasri, for much guidance uh, and uh, commitment to the partnership with the Institute. Um, I, we're joined on stage here by my good friend and colleague, Ambassador Bill Taylor, who's uh, serving as the Executive Vice President for USIP. He will be the moderator today. Um, and it, Bill was previously the special coordinator for Middle Eastern assistance at the State Department. And in that role, he was an, uh, an advocate and champion for Tunisia from the very beginning of the post-revolutionary period, from 2010 to 2013. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest of honor, His Excellency, <laughs> President uh, Beji Kayed Asebsi, who in a word, or in two words, is simply a statesman and a leader. Um, sir, you have been a central, two words. Uh, you have been a central figure in Tunisia for decades and since 2011 an important source of stability and confidence. And since uh, President Asebsi was sworn, as, sworn in as president of Tunisia in December 2014, um, he has charted a critical course through many challenges. In his swearing-in ceremony, President Asebsi vowed to be president of all Tunisian men and women without exclusion, and to be president uh, uh, who would build consensus among all parties and social movements. We're honored to host you here with us today, President Asebsi. Uh, we understand you are meeting with President Obama tomorrow. Uh, but in the meantime, and today, uh, you've promised to give us a glimpse into your future, into your vision of the future as you move through these critical challenges. So everybody, please join me in welcoming His Excellency President Asebsi to the podium. Sorry, I have to speak in English. This is the And you have translation, I hope. 
we'll see about that. Al fuq, there, Sana. That's my fear, Mo. Over here. Over here. Over here. Over here. Over وكذلك أيضا سفير تايلور على هذه الدعوة الكريمة واللي استجبت لها بكل أرياحية لأني أعرف أهمية هذه المؤسسة أجل السلم ونحن حياتنا كلها مخصصة للدفاع عن السلم هذه ترجم هذا سبعة وأريد أن أذكر أن هذه الزيارة الثانية الرسمية اللي يقوم بها في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية بدعوة من الرئيس باراك أوباما الزيارة الفايتة يعني في أكتوبر 11 In October 2011, four years ago, I promised President Obama to continue working to enhance democracy in Tunisia. And today, four years later, we were elected in the year. And after we organized the election in 2011, we gave the people the right to vote and the power to those who were elected because we respected the results of the election. But we know that the people who were elected at that time were part of our party or of our movement. Most of them were part of our party or of our movement. Most of them were from the Islamic party. حيوهم ساعة ونباء كما فرق ما بين إسلامي ومسلم أنا دائما تقع الذبابية هنا الإسلامي هي حركة سياسية بالأساس تستعمل الدين مش توصل إلى الحكم وأحيانا تستعمل العنف للأصول إلى هذا الحكم والمسلم كيف أنا أنا مسلم وتواصل like كل أغلب المسلمين يعني المسلم ديانة ولكن الإسلام في تونس ديانة متفتحة تتعايش مع كل الديانات حتى في القرآن اللي هو المرجعية متاعنا فيها آية يقول لكم دينكم ولي دين مش معناها انتم عندكم دين ونحن عندنا دين ولكن هو الرب واحد والأديان ما تضربش بشر هي اللي تضرب هي اللي تأول الدين على حسب على كل حال من حسن تونس اليوم أن الحزب اللي كان ينعت بكونه حزب إسلامي so ولا حزب سياسي لما حالة ولكن عنده مرجعية دينية مرجعية إسلامية وتوأس أغلبهم مسلمين Jews Tunisia is the only country in the world where Muslims and Jews coexist without any problem. And in Tunisia today, we have the oldest religious movement. I'm talking about Judaism, of course. I mean, we've been having Jews for 2,500 years in Tunisia. Our Jews are in, were in Tunisia before they came to the United States. And we live in total harmony. And Tunisian, Jewish Tunisian, celebrated a religious feast, which is al Ghriba, and Jews came from all over the world to celebrate. And of course, under the supervision and the auspices of the president with the government, represented, and it was just great. So there is a genuine coexistence between religions in Tunisia. Contrary to what 
may be the case in other countries. So during the last four years, we sort of moved towards a democracy. The only Arab Muslim country with a democratic system that was implemented within this very short period of time. At this point in Tunisia, we have an elected president of the republic. He is elected by the people in all transparency. And the president is myself. I was elected by the Tunisian people with a very comfortable majority. Why do I say so? Because there are other candidates. There were 27 candidates for the presidential elections in Tunisia. So there is the new president and there is the old president who left, of course, his post following the elections. We have an elected parliament. And what's specific about it is that the members of the parliament represent all Tunisians' hues and colors. And of course, political as well. And all the president or all those who were candidates for presidency, of course, were not necessarily representing these parties. We have five important parties who are now in the parliament, including the party with an Islamic reference. And those parties coexist in the parliament. And we formed a government. And contrary to what used to happen for the last 60 years, this government is a coalition government, which means that it includes five countries, four important countries, and a fifth one less important. And this government has been working so far without any major problems. And it also got a comfortable vote of confidence from the parliament. We have 217 members of parliament. The government got 166 votes of confidence. So this is a government of stability. And it is in power for five years. We hope that it will remain for five years. But it is not the president who decides if the government remains or not. It depends on its achievement. This government is on the right track. And the majority formed by these four parties, and I have four MPs here, each from one of these parties, including the Islamic party. He's a Muslim like me. And all the other parties are represented. And we are the Nida Tunis, or the call of Tunisia. I cannot be president of the party anymore because I'm president now, according to the constitution. But those who voted for me in majority were women, and I hugely respect women. But this does not mean that everything we did in Tunisia was easy. We faced lots of problems, and we still are facing many others. First, the democratic track I mean, political reform cannot succeed if it's not supported by economic development. The economy is a part of the political process. And it's not only Tunisia that faces this kind of problem. In all Arab countries and Islamic countries, we cannot see any other democracy. As for the developed world led by the United States of America, we know that they want to generalize democracy all over the world, especially in the third world. And I won't say 
underdeveloped, but developing. We have to be optimistic. So we know that Tunisia took its independence in 1956. And at that time, the president was a reformist, President Habib Bourguiba. He pushed Tunisia in this direction. He started reforming the society because the Tunisian society was an underdeveloped society as other societies. So he started with the reforms. The first reform he started with was liberating women in Tunisia. And women in Tunisia now have been free since our independence. And women in Tunisia now play a role that is similar to that of men, the same status between women and men in Tunisia. Second, he also generalized education because he understood that development needs education and technology. So he systemized education. And there is no one single Tunisian who can go to school that cannot find a place in school for free. So the Tunisian people is different from the Tunisian people when Tunisia got its independence. And I was there. I'm not that young. I was there for independence. I've lived all these periods, so I know what I'm talking about. When Tunisia took its independence, our main problem, and on which we wasted lots of time, was to face and fight ignorance. Because we were an undeveloped people. I mean, people who were there at this time know that we used to have board to teach old people, young people, how to read the alphabet. And they would ask, is this going to lead to anything? And Bogiba would say, this will have a positive result. And this is what we've witnessed, indeed. So what is our problem today? It's not about facing ignorance. But we need to find jobs for people who have high diplomas. They don't have jobs. Because education moved forward and was quicker than financial and economic development. And this is a major problem. So because of what happened 60 years ago, again, the Tunisian people today is not the people that we found in 56. It is different from people who do not have education and did not liberate women. We generalize education, we freed women. And of course, at a religious confessional level, we did not have problems despite the differences. In Tunisia today, despite the differences that some believe exist. We all live together, we work together, and at a political level, all parties are coexisting and working together responsibly. So this is a major change that we witnessed in Tunisia. As for the reforms, We can say that Tunisia now is part of the club of the democratic countries. And hopefully, I mean, the situation will continue and stabilize. But if we want to preserve this experience, we need to develop the economic situation. We have two main challenges. First, the security challenge and counterterrorism. And terrorism is not a Tunisian-rooted one. It comes from abroad. I mean, Tunisia has its own problems, but it suffers from the problem of the whole region. I'm not mentioning any country, because I don't want any diplomatic problem. 
So we are fighting terrorism. But our friends need to help us in fighting terrorism. And let me state clearly that the United States of America are helping Tunisia in fighting terrorism. But we want a stronger cooperation because we have a border with a neighboring country, which is Libya. And you know that these borders are open and lots of terrorism are moving to Tunisia through these borders. And in Libya, we have no state at this point. There are lots of groups, group of people. I don't want to talk about terrorism and so on, or terrorists, because I am responsible for my words. When I was president of a party, I would speak freely, but now I'm president of a state. So I have to be, you know, cautious. So there are problems between these groups. And then there is the Libya of the north and the Libya in the south. So we have a government in the north and a government in the west. And they are in disagreement. There are lots of differences. But there is also ISIL or Daesh in Libya, the so-called Islamic State. And of course, Islam is innocent from all these kind of organizations. These people are terrorists. But they are in Libya and no one is facing them. They are fighting one another. And they are harming neighboring countries, including Egypt and Tunisia. We is the most developed and open country and is facing the most problems. So given this situation, we need to find solution. Of course, we hope that all the parties in Libya will get closer together, that the states will be back and we will have the same old good relation. But at this point, the situation is not under control in Libya. And in Tunisia, we have one million Libyan living in our country because they cannot live in Libya. And this means further responsibilities for my country and creates more problems. And Libya is one of the closest countries to Tunisia. We used to have a huge cooperation, but it all ended now. Tunisia is being punished because we are receiving terrorists and weapons. And second, there's no cooperation anymore between Tunisia and Libya. And according to statistics, Tunisia, because of this situation in Libya, lost $5.7 billion. And for a small country like mine, this is huge. I mean, this would have helped us maybe get rid of our crisis. And also, we have those million Libyans in Tunisia that are costing the country at many levels, security level and so on. We are a small country with 11 million inhabitants. And this is making it hard to improve the cost of living because the Libyans who are in Tunisia At this point, they are in a better situation than many Tunisians. So they are paying to buy and the prices are increasing. The price of houses, the cost of life is now increasing for ordinary Tunisians. And this is making it hard for us to continue to enhance the democratic process that we've started. So we would want our friends and chiefly the United States of America, with which we have been friends for many, many decades since our independence, because the United States has been helping us. But as I said four years ago to the President of the United States, 
our relation goes back to the 18th century. The first country to recognize the independence of the United States was Tunisia. And when Tunisia got its independence, the first country to recognize the independence of Tunisia was the United States of America. So our relation for a long, long time has been privileged, and we hope that this will continue to be the fact. And after this visit, I do hope that the relation between the United States and Tunisia will start looking towards the future once again, because we want to work for the future. The future that we want in Tunisia is a state of law, is an enhanced democratic process. Because the democratic process can only succeed if there is a state of law. And this is what we want to build. And I know that because I've been in the public life for 63 years. We know how we started, how we evolved, how we got to what we are today. And I hope that God will help me working for a better future. In the future, we want a state of law. But we want also to enhance the democratic system because, as I told you, democracy needs lots of priority. First, bringing security and stability by fighting terrorism. And second, developing our economy that is now in a rather bad shape. And in order to improve our economy, we need to bring in foreign investment. And in order to do so, we need to encourage uh, internal investments as well. And uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador Cutler, you know the story, don't you? Yeah, he's our friend and uh, he was a former ambassador of the United States in Tunisia. Therefore, we have to create the necessary environment that uh, would encourage more investments. And in order not to be uh, to, to uh, mislead you, we still don't have that kind of environment. However, as a president, I have made the suggestion. However, there are some difficulties. Not everyone uh, thinks uh, alike, and not everyone thinks about the future, and not everyone has the same feeling of patriotism. Uh, however, Regardless of who likes or doesn't, we are going to make Tunis come out of this difficult situation and uh, how, hopefully it will not stand alone in this difficult situation. Because now that we are having uh, difficulties, do you want everybody to just stand there and look at us? However, we hope that what we have done so far in Tunisia and that uh, our friends always mentioned, uh, led uh, by our friends uh, here in the United States, uh, a very uh, uh, isn't that the case, Ambassador T Cutler, uh, Tyler? Uh, therefore, we will uh, continue on this path, and we are determined to do so, whether we are alone or with the help of friends. And the help from our friends is what will allow us to accelerate the uh, larger reforms that we uh, hope uh, to achieve and through which we can improve the situation. Before closing, I would like to say that we in Tunisia, the political system that we are following does not, does not create any political sen sensibilities. We know that a lot of countries like you would say, and those, uh, these people that the, the, uh, from the Muslim Brotherhood, well, we don't have these people. Whatever the sensitivities, we, uh, they are all, everyone is Muslim. And people are asking, how do you allow them to be part of the government? Yes, sir. We in our country, we, in order to have a stable government for anyone who wants to invest, can find themselves in a stable country. Let me say that we have, I personally do not have a problem because I'm the one who made the suggestion and uh, who uh, enforced it. Uh, we uh, don't have a problem with Nahda. They are Tunisians and they are a part of the uh, whole of Tunisia. Their uh, 
had uh, their president, uh, Mr. Rashid Ghanoushi, is helping us and he's helping his country, but he's also helping his own party. The fact uh, that uh, we are together govern in the same government, I'm personally very happy that, that they are uh, uh, governing or uh, helping us with the government or our partners in the government are also from uh, Nahda. And uh, we have everyone from the uh, other parties, which are Al Nida and Afaq and Nahda. They're Everyone is there. I personally, I was elected by the Tunisian people. I guarantee the success of this experiment. Tunisia today, of course, everything is not pink. There are definitely things that aren't as well as good. For on the one hand, we have high unemployment. We are a people of 11 million inhabitants, and of those, 216,000 are unemployed. Of those, 250,000 are uh, have high uh, degrees. This is a situation that cannot last for long. Many people say that, oh, you have a lot of people who went to jihad. Yes, we say so. Why? Because we have high unemployment. Yes, we have a lot of uh, uh, poverty. There are some regions of our country that are totally marginalized. Therefore, we have to take care of that. Uh, there was a, a revolution that took place in Tunisia on December 17th. Uh, 2010 and until January 14, 2011. Why? Because of unemployment and because of the social situation and uh, because of these deep uh, pockets of uh, poverty and because people want to be a part of the economic uh, situation. Therefore, we should not minimize, if we, if we were to minimize this uh, situation, then our democratic path will remain uh, threatened. We therefore tell all our friends uh, who are uh, constantly and every day thanking us uh, for our achievements and our successes, well, let me say that it's very, we're still very vulnerable and it would disappear if the economic situation does not improve and along with the social uh, situation otherwise we would be regressing that's what i wanted to tell you here in the united states where uh, we are uh, tunisians are always welcomed and president uh, obama was the first president to have uh, congratulated the people for this revolution uh, after mohammed bazizi uh, sacrifice his life in order to for us to get here. I would like to say very clearly that Tunisia needs peace. However, if we don't get peace, we're not going to go back. We're going to continue by ourselves. That's what I wanted to say. And in all cases, this is an opportunity for us uh, to uh, greet our friends in the United States and uh, greet uh, President Barack Obama, with whom uh, we have talked several times about this subject, and he has encouraged us all the way. This is the second time I receive an invitation to visit the United States. When I meet with high officials, with Mr. Vice President uh, and uh, the uh, Secretary of State, Mr. Kerry, with whom I met this morning. And we are meeting uh, the higher officials, uh, the high officials of this government. And although uh, it's a very important, but I wanted to come here today because you are working on for peace and that's what allows people to live, uh, to live uh, comfortably, to eat, drink, and also to work. And that's something I hope we can achieve with your help and uh, even by ourselves, if you don't want to help us. And thank you very much. <laughs> Oh.
Yes. Also, people in another room, you have drawn so many people here to the Institute of Peace that they are in a separate room as well. Um, and there are other people who are watching us online um, who can also, by the way, send you questions um, if they use the hashtag Esepsi USIP. So on behalf of all of the viewers here in the next room and in the ether, thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you. We do have, we do have an opportunity for some questions. Um, let me start if, uh, if yes, you would yes, agree. Yes. You have this opportunity to reintroduce Tunisia to the American people. Uh, Americans, of course, know that the history of, of Tunisia goes back 5,000 years. Carthage. The American people know that uh, World War II battles took place in Tunisia. Kazarine Pass. There is a lovely American cemetery in Tunis that, uh, that is beautifully kept. Uh, People know that the Arab Spring, you mentioned um, the beginning, and, and Nancy Lindborg mentioned that the beginning of the Arab Spring began in Tunisia. You have just described, for all of the Americans watching here, how you have put together a coalition of across Tunisia. Um, and so the question, Mr. President, as you are reintroducing Tunisia uh, to the United States and to Americans and to the world, is Tunisia a model that can bring together Muslim Arab democracy in one place and the success? Or is it the exception that proves the rule? Is it the exception that in, when we look out at the rest, at much of the rest of the Arab world, democracy is challenged? Is it the model or is it the exception? Until this day, we are the exception. However, we hope we can become the model. The, the model that would be emulated by others in the world. And we can be the model, but that depends on the role that the United States wishes to play. If the U.S. and not others uh, assists and uh, helps uh, Tunisia, yes, we can become a model. Otherwise, we will remain an exception. This exception cannot last forever. It can be threatened because what we try to do is a paradigm of a social model that is different from what exists in other Arab and Islamic countries. And therefore, our model will always be threatened because of its vulnerability. I personally am known to believe in the role that the U.S. has played during the war. The U.S. Uh, stopped Nazism, and without it, Nazism would have still been uh, prevalent today, and without it, it would have spread around the uh, around Europe. The U.S. has also contributed in uh, helping just causes just like ours. Therefore, the U.S. and this is something that's important for the American people. If the U.S. wants to play a role, and an important role, and a role that will be remembered by history, therefore it must work to make that this ex exception that Tunisia is becomes a model that can be emulated. Therefore, we believe that uh, the U.S. has the possibility, the ability, and and also the ability to change situations and things. This, what we can say is that our experience is uh, available for everyone and we will continue to work uh, for the expansion and uh, for the uh, elaboration of this uh, example for everyone to get peace. Sayyid al Rais. Is with us still. Yes. Other countries have the same types of difficulties, of justice, this concept. About several weeks, about three weeks ago, 
um, we had the Iraqi Prime Minister, Abadi, um, here in this building, and we talked about justice with him. He talked about the challenges of reconciliation and the challenges of the threats of revenge. Two months ago, um, we had the new Afghan president, Ashraf Ghani, sitting right here in the chair that, that you are sitting in. But you well. are not the same thing. You're not the same. <laughs> we are not confused. <laughs> but he also struggles with justice in Afghanistan. He was asked, Mr. President, about this question, and he said he wants to look forward, he doesn't want to look back. You have a Truth and Dignity Commission um, in Tunisia to address these issues. What are your hopes, your expectations, your concerns uh, about that commission and, and justice going forward? I'm not against. Good. No. But, but they must know that the situation in Tunisia is not... Well, je parle en anglais maintenant. <laughs> C'est très bien. C'est très, très bien. <laughs> the situation in Tunisia is not so easy to do. Yes. It is very complicated. Yes, we, we, we think that we must fight for the, the right of the, uh, the man. Droit de l'homme. Human rights. Human rights. Well, man or woman, it is the same. For us too. Uh, for us too. Well. But we have people who don't eat, who is very poor, who don't have work, I think it is primary to respond to that. You have uh, uh, un curé, curé, uh, un homme uh, de, de religion. Yes. Il n'est pas musulman, mais il est chrétien. Yes, priest. Priest. Qu'est-ce qu'il a dit? Il faut un minimum de bien-être pour pratiquer la vertu. Uh, the monk, the priest said there has to be some welfare in order to practice uh, virtue. So if human rights are virtue, we cannot appreciate them if we have an empty stomach and if we don't have work and we are poor. So what are the priorities? I would say the priority is to feed those who are hungry first, otherwise they're going to die. So what's the point uh, to defend their rights when they're going to end up in the cemetery? However, notwithstanding, we still we need to give priority to, the defend, to uh, defending uh, human rights. Therefore, the two are not contradictory. However, there are priorities. And the one priority is to give these people a job. And the conditions, the situation that we have created in Tunisia is that it is the first country that has a commission for human rights. And until this time, we still have it. But in the other authoritarian regimes and dictatorial uh, regimes, whatever you want to call them, it still existed because the people want something like that. And I, I am now el elected by the people, therefore I cannot be against it. Well, uh, from the audience. And let's start uh, right here. And if you could state your name, keep it short. We're a little tight on time and address your questions. I'm Taboni, a Libyan American. I would like to see the relationship between Tunisia and Libya and how can the United States, as you said, is the key player for, for this relationship and how can we have Tunisia as a model since it's very close and it's important, critical for Tunisia as well, what's happening in Libya. Uh. You're right. You have to know that the Tunisian people is the people that is closest to the Libyan people. And therefore, during the revolution of Libya, it is Tunisia that helped uh, those people. And Tunisia welcomed a million and a half people uh, who came as refugees from all 
uh, everyone. And bec during the al-Qaddafi, everybody was there. The Libyan families were welcomed by Tunisians in their homes, in their families, because those people are the closest there is to one another. Our hope is that the Libyan people can wake up and uh, and, and uh, uh, constitute an, their own state, and we will be happy to see that Libya has become a state. And I can confirm to you that our friends here in the United States are will, will do agree with us and are ready to help Tunisia and Libya in order for Libya to get out of this uh, situation. However, we are now going through, uh, we're suffering from terrorism. And that's terrorism that uh, for Tunisia is what's in Libya, because ISIL is in Libya and Libyans are not uh, busy, uh, you know, fighting terrorism, but they're busy fighting one another. So our hope is that people will return to consciousness and that uh, there will be a government and a unifying government in Libya and the state, and we will be the first uh, people that will rejoice for the stabilization in uh, Tripoli and uh, uh, Tobruk and Sirt and all these. Uh, you, as a Libyan, you know that in history, when Libya was uh, uh, under occupation, and you know since 1911, we don't have to uh, uh, remind uh, what uh, which country, so we don't get into another Pandora's box. However, many of those Libyans came to Tunisia and lived in Tunis, and there is not a, a city in Tunisia that's not called the quarter, the Libyan's quarter, the Trabulsi or the Tripolitan's uh, quarter because uh, we have been under occupation by so many people. However, this is something I can confirm to you that our true desire is that Libya goes back to normal. We, right now, we are really losing uh, because of the situation in Libya, so we do hope that things go back to normal. There, we, we can, you can really count on us to bring Libya back to its true and uh, real stability. Too many young Tunisians are leaving Tunisia to go to, to Iraq and Syria. Um, how do you intend to deal with that problem? If, I can. if they have been to Iraq and to Syria, it's because the, the situation in Tunisia does not allow them to feel uh, stable. They are young, they are unemployed, they are not very conscious, they're not aware, and then there are some groups that we call nonprofit organizations that are encouraging them to leave. They're also funding that uh, exodus. However, when things have changed, we so, shut the door to uh, travel to Syria and Iraq and all those places. However, whenever those people come back, we still embrace them and we try to re-include them in normal life. But that's difficult because someone who got used to uh, hold a weapon and killing other people and uh, aggresses others, that's that's something that has to stop. We are aware of what's going on and uh, whatever mistakes they have committed, they are our children, they're ours, and therefore we have to bear with them. And hopefully we will find them occupations, jobs. There are people who are leaving or who are leaving and would go to Italy and then would die uh, uh, in the ocean because they would uh, go in small boats and many of those have already died and we also hope that we can stop this. Uh, so this trend uh, uh, with Italy has uh, stopped but we have cooperated with the government of Italy and we have stopped this tendency. If every country that wants for Tunisia to remain, remain democratic and stable, they must help us in this respect. My name is Josh Rogan. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg View oh, here in that. Washington. Mr. President, thank you for your time today. Uh, in 2011, when the Arab Spring began in Tunisia, uh, the U.S. government proposed a huge program 
to support the transition of countries in the region that was led by Ambassador Taylor. Unfortunately, uh, the U.S. Congress never funded that effort. Uh, last year, Tunisia received about $50 million in U.S. assistance, being a democratic government, whereas the military regime in Egypt received about $1.5 billion in assistance. What I'm wondering is, in your view, what, what does that say about U.S. government priorities in the region do you think that the U.S. has abandoned the ideals of the Arab Spring? And what will be your message to President Obama tomorrow about America's commitment to democracy, civil rights, and human rights in the region? Thank you. I met President Obama four years ago, and I already gave him my message. First of all, there is no such thing as an Arab Spring. This is a European invention. We were invited in the G8 uh, summit in 2011 in Deauville, and I was invited, and I had the uh, Prime Minister of Egypt, and at the time I was a Prime Minister, but not as uh, President. So. I said there is no such thing as an Arab Spring. And then and there is the beginning of a Tunisian Spring. If this Tunisian Spring is confirmed, perhaps another day it might become an Arab Spring. That's what I was saying. However, as I said earlier, now we are the exception. However, in order for us to become a model, let us at least succeed in Tunisia. And we have not succeeded yet. Yes, of course, we have uh, achieved a few steps and uh, we still lack economic success in order to really get to the results uh, we need. And that uh, economic result has not taken place yet in Tunisia. Therefore, if friends want to help us, then perhaps then we will be able to uh, benefit and then go on to become an Arab Spring. As to what the United States does, I don't want to talk about it because I am now in the U.S. and I respect its leadership and its people and it's none of our business. If they help us, fine. If they don't help us, we are going to stay friends and we will continue on our own. However, let me say that uh, uh, the President has promised me, he said personally, that he is going to help Tunisia. So I'm going to meet him tomorrow, but I'm not going to remind him, oh, you remember you told me you were going to assist me, and then he might open the, the thing for discussion. But I do know that our relations are continuing, and uh, we are working together, and that the United States and its leadership are all very interested in the experiment that is taking the experience that is taking place in Tunisia and that can become a model to others because as I said earlier I'm not happy that we are the only ones that are alone because everybody is going to be looking at us and being jealous and everybody will want to uh, make us falter but I am personally confident that the United States is standing by our side and will support us with whatever is possible. We cannot tell them how much we want. We can say whatever you can afford us. And although we know that the United States has large means, it does not, uh, it has other uh, problems and other people around the world to, do, to worry about. The United States is the uh, spinal cord of the entire world because they care for the rest of the world. However, what we're asking is just a little more. And uh, perhaps at that point we can step forward a little more. Ladaina. Believe. And let me go here to this uh, lady in white. <clears throat> It'll have to be brief, and I know Mr. The, uh, the President is headed for the Hill. He's going to see the House and the Senate. Very important meetings for the, for the reasons that you just described. Absolutely, uh, yes. This, this will be important. So, last question. Yes, ma'am. Said Rais, marhaba bik Uh Mr. President, uh, you're welcome in Tunisia. Yes, my name is Jehan Burkhadr. Are you Tunisian? Oh, whose daughter are you? 
<laughs> ah, you should have said that earlier. Uh, yes, yeah, there's a small world, but however. The question is very brief and quick. Yes. In terms of human rights in Tunisia, mm -hmm. uh, we are aware of many people in Tunisia abusing human rights to, to act uh, violently and do terrorist uh, attacks. So they they having their uniforms, they having they're wearing uh, their own clothes, and they're free to wear to wear wherever they want. And the Tunisia government been very uh, understanding, and even people they were understanding. But at a certain level, these kind of uniforms, the niqab, especially the women uh, clothes, they're um, posing a threat to the national security. There were many women and even men wearing niqab. They were caught with weapons, they were involved in recruiting jihadists, and even women to go to Syria. Now, I'm not saying everyone is like that. My question is, and I'm very concerned as a Tunisian citizen, how the Tunisian government, I won't say you, I would say the Tunisian government will deal with this. This is the first the concern. The second concern, very quick, is the Quranic and the, the, uh, the, um, the, the kindergarten um, uh, places that were uh, open illegally without the government authorization. They're poisoning our next generations uh, with extremist ideas. The how are you going to deal with that? Here. We and have the, thank Senate. you. Very good. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you for the question. Have a good stay. First, we are with a freedom of dress. If you want to cover your head, go ahead. If you don't, just don't. When we talk about the freedom of the people, they are free to do whatever they like. As for the niqab, if a woman wants to wear a niqab, let her do so, but let her stay in her house. I mean, if she does not want to be part of the people to go to university, let her decide. But if she wants to participate, she'd better show her face. In her privacy, she may wear niqab if she wants. But also we want to support women who wants to wear a skirt and show their legs. This is not a problem in Tunisia. As for human rights, there's no country more respectful of human rights than Tunisia. But human rights cannot move forward if we allow people to be free to hurt us. So, yes, we want freedom, but we want freedom to be responsible. I mean, a Tunisian should know that he is socially responsible, he is responsible in his job, in his family. He needs to respect the law and he will be respected. Of course, there are abuses in all countries, as we know, everywhere, worldwide. It has nothing to do with development. But of course, these are exceptions. In Tunisia, we do not have huge abuses. But when we face such abuses, we go to court and we sanction. Otherwise, everything is about the circumstances of life. People living in Tunisia should not be needy. And hopefully, we will be working out this situation. And you greet your father for me. <laughs> Say hello. And when he comes back to Tunisia, I tell him to visit me. Joining us here. Uh. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats until the official party departs. The president heads for the Congress. Thank you. Uh. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats until the official party departs. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats until the official party departs.